Hi everyone, um, welcome back to another uh, podcast with me, John Kent, the uh, founder of In The Office and our chief storyteller, Adam Scorey. Um, today, we're going to talk about culture and whether it's a place or a mindset. Um, this has come about because of uh, the way that um, companies are now talking about trying to get people back into the office and using you know, the excuse, some might say, of we need to build a strong culture um, with our company. So we need people back and to be co-located for that. So I guess um, I'll ask you, Adam, uh, is culture a place or a mindset? Um, I think it's actually a bit of both um, for me. It, it it starts, I think, as a mindset, um, but it, it lives in a place too. Um, and but i don't think you need to have a place to have a culture so um i I disagree wholeheartedly with what ceos are doing and if they are trying to lever culture as the reason for coming back to the office i i really disagree with that and think we've got it all wrong if that's the case because for me a business isn't it's chairs it's desks it's apple laptops it's it's people and I think that's where the culture lives is inside the people. I guess it's not akin. It's it's akin to faith. You don't have to have a church to have faith. And that for me, it feels like the same kind of thing. I grew up with a father. He's a minister. Um, I'm not a person of faith. But for him, you know, he came round to actually. Do you know what? You don't. It doesn't need to. But you don't need to pray in a church. You can pray anywhere. You know, you can go out and stand in a field. So for me, I truly believe it's it's a mindset, and and its place changes depending on where you are, you carry that culture with you. Um, yeah, I strongly believe that. So so culture is this sort of intangible thing that just affects the way that people behave, I guess, yeah. is is a, a sort of way that you could say it. So if that's the case, um, is there a problem? This is probably going to be a horrible question now. Is there a problem with trying to bring people back to a single location that the company can control in order to try to to create that that faith, that culture? I don't think so. No, um, I think it depends on the data that they're using or the, the, what reason they're actually you know doing using to to bring people back in. If that's the sole reason that they think their culture is going to fall apart because there's no one in the office, then how do businesses that have only remote workers manage to generate a culture of productivity and solve problems, which is what businesses are for in the end, ultimately, how do they do that? We're not hearing that all these remote only op businesses are failing. In fact, they're thriving. So yes, I think there are elements to a culture that need a place to be, but whether that's a Costa, a Nero, a pub, a, you know, a, um, a go ape my one of my team went to you know we went to go ape together that's a place that the culture is expanded and grown and thrived and built and and fed so hmm. i disagree if they're only using that data to say right the culture is in the office and there is no culture is in the office personally i think that's a, an element of trust that's lacking or an old-fashioned paradigm you know the 500 year old paradigm about what an office actually is now or, or was successfully during the pandemic and slightly after and then the fear has kicked back in and it's no okay we're gonna we know people think that culture is important it's um it's a strong uh, emotional pull into a business and uh, leaders have spoken a huge amount about culture through the pandemic now there feels to me like they're leveraging that word to achieve something that they through fear want to have happen I think that's um, it's really interesting actually because you know the culture of fear, and you know it's quite well documented how some people really thrive in that scenario. So I guess it's it depends on each individual company really, doesn't it? But some companies will have a a leader or the managers who, or even a team where the culture within that team is sometimes of fear or of thriving from negativity or you know of trying to prove that you're better there's also the the flip side where it's actually some people if you 
induce fear in them, they're going to fall apart. So I guess it's how do you how do you find the right culture for the right company, but then mm -hmm. also it's not just about company, is it? It's about the company culture, so the higher level culture, but then the microcultures of each team or each each um, sub team or each portion of that team. Yeah. So how 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 do you work out what the right culture is for each one? Is is yeah? How how yeah. would you do that? Well, I think there's there's different elements to a culture. You know, in a small business like ours, when you start up, the culture will come from you as the founder, and you express what you know, kind of the aims and objectives of the business. And I think that's where some of the culture emanates from. And and, and I think that's the the right thing. The culture should be in place, the framework of that culture to achieve the aims and goals and the vision, mission, values of the company. Um. As the company gets larger, it's obviously much harder for an individual to maintain not, not so much a hold because I don't think you should necessarily control it. I think it should be organic, the culture, but it then becomes a very different beast when you've got lots of people feeding in. I mean, this can then, you know, you can go into recruitment of the right people for the right culture, but I think the culture needs to be really tied in quite um quite well with the overall objectives and the ambitions and it needs to be fed almost on a daily basis this culture about well why are we here what are we trying to do which i think then once people can have a platform from which to understand the culture which comes from actually the culture set up to um to help produce or solve the challenges within the business the bit that I, I really, that frustrates me is that there is only one thing. Culture is a thing and everybody wants to have mm. the same culture. You know, we've heard, you know, Stephen Bartlett famously, I like, goodness only knows what the culture was like in his business. I think amazing because it thrived, you know, the blue slide and the ball fall and stuff like that. Um, I mean, you, 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 I remember talking about this with you just the other day and you were talking about Pixar. Just tell us a little mm. bit about that. Cause that, that for me was like, well, that, that to me sums up what I've just kind of, kind of not particularly well. Uh, um, uh, not eloquently described but tell us about that because that for me really sums this up this Pixar the way that they create a culture well, yeah so I mean it's not to go straight into that but to to talk a bit about what you what you just said though um yeah. the the culture needs to work for for those people and there isn't a single culture and there does seem to be that sort of striving for everyone should have the same culture yeah. and with pixar obviously you know it's one of the most creative companies in the world um and the culture was famously sort of um architected by steve jobs and the way that he built the the offices of pixar to try to encourage these sort of accidental encounters and um encourage um people to just be able to sit and do work and and actually also to stay there and and not leave the office till till the work's done which now you know might actually may or may not be the right way to go about it um but the the other core things that they were trying to implement was huge high levels of psychological safety right yeah. and yeah. And making sure that um, I think it was that you know whatever happens, the manager of of uh, or the leader of a project, they can ask for for help from other people. They're welcoming feedback, but ultimately they remain in control of that project. So mm -hmm. they are the ultimate decision maker, but they're welcoming feedback because because of the level of psychological safety the feedback then isn't taken personally it's about the work so if you're i remember there was a story um i think it's in the i can't remember the name of the book now but the pixar book yeah. um uh we can probably put notes in the in the <laughs> put, put it in the notes down here um, people <laughs> yeah um but yeah the that when they were doing filming brave and there was a scene where the wooden door was meant to be propped open by a stick and um, they every week they have a basically a show and tell where they show the what they've done recently. And someone said, "Do we really think that stick would hold the door open? That that looks wrong to me. It just it's too too small. It looks like it would snap." So rather than going, but I, you know I've spent hours designing this. Probably not hours because it's all done with technology. Um, but rather than going, oh, but that's you know I feel like you're insulting my work and yeah, you're yeah. not appreciating what I put into it. It was a yes. We're, you know, we're trying to make something great. 
So the focus is on the work. All the feedback can come in, but it's not personal because I'm not saying giving you feedback and saying that's not quite up to standard. So therefore I'm saying you're rubbish. I'm saying this work, we, we're trying to together to make this the best. So therefore let's do it. And if you disagree, argue back, absolutely fine. Then the, the leader, the project leader will make the ultimate decision and then we move on. Yeah. So um, and the, the, I, I describe it quite, uh, um, it's probably not the most eloquent thing, but I, the, the, the snake needs to have a head. But the rest of the mm. body is made up of all these moving parts, you know. Um, so I, I totally agree with that. And I think that's a wonderful piece. But the crucial bit there is that, as you mentioned, that psychological safety to be able to go. I'm not in fear of putting my hand up and going, I think that's, I don't think that's very good. Mm. That's a huge, that, that points to me towards, right, the, the culture has been designed, really carefully designed to achieve one thing. Mm. It's not constrained. Um, although there are constraints, I suppose, as such, but it's not constrained and it's designed for everybody to bring their best self every single day. Yeah. And that, that's yeah. Wow, what a powerful environment. To, and and um, I can only imagine, OK, not every industry is a creative industry, how this would work for an accountant or a lawyer where they're you know, very strictly guarded or a government department. I mean, that must be really tough to, you know, because I don't mm. know, I've not worked for a government department. Is their culture dictated to by whoever's in power at the time? Yeah. Do you yeah. see what I mean? So, but I think that that purposefulness of culture is what generates that impetus, that power, that kind of nuclear engine inside. And and something we've spoken about before is it, it's that combination of, I think the phrase you used was actions over intentions or actions and intentions. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah. it's the design, you know, that's there's parenthesis around that, but it's designed at the top for that purpose. And that's super powerful and, and inspiring mm -hmm. too. Well, yeah, and actually with the sort of actions and intentions, it's the what someone intends, what a leader intends to be a culture and how they sort of tell the company, this is the way we're going to act. Um, you know, I think a really brilliant one is the, right, we don't want people working at weekends yeah. as a CEO going, well, we've heard about the four day working week and all of these people are really productive. So no one's working on at weekends or no one, you know, meeting free Fridays. Yeah. And yeah, then yeah. the first week, the CEO goes, oh, I'm actually sending emails on Saturday and Sunday. Don't don't respond because you shouldn't work at the weekend, but I'm working at the weekend. So it's, you know, the <laughs> the intention is is yeah, is to go in one way, but actually their actions are completely dictating the other the other thing. Don't do um, what I do, do what I say. It's like Yeah, exactly. And and I think that's a really that's a really hard thing for leaders to get right because mm there is especially at the moment there is this you know culture of what well, country-wide or global culture of trying to show that you work all hours of the day and you know god forbid you get some sleep you know no one should be sleeping you should always be working otherwise how are you going to be successful you know the the i speak to a lot of um people who are starting businesses where they're all sort of quoting things that other entrepreneurs have said in the past, you know, some of the big entrepreneurs where they're talking about how much work you have to put into it. And they're all spouting the same stuff that that was said there. And you're going, well, actually, you're setting up the culture, even though it's just you as a one person, you're setting up a culture that is you have to work all time, which yeah. means that you don't get the chance to step away and have a break and think about being creative or innovative, um, as we know from studies that, you know, if you have a break, you'll come back and you'll be revitalized and you'll you'll be more productive. Um, so it's, um, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Lots of little things make up the ingredients. I mean, it, it's the ingredients of the cake scenario, I guess. I mean, the eggs, the flour, the butter, the sugar, um, and the chocolate and the fruit, whatever it is, but it, you can't have one without the other because without those ingredients, it's, but it, it, it needs that design that, that I think that recipe to, to continue the poor analogy is really, really important around mm. focusing on the outcome. Um, but also, I think from a, from a leader's perspective, and, and I've probably been guilty of this a little bit myself when I've led teams, is not necessarily allowing that culture to expand and grow organically. Mm. Um, I, not to say through fear, but just purely through practical reasons about well, how far do you let this go? How much authority do I truly have as a as a head of, you know? And then that's 
the culture of the person who is leading me, I, you know, do I feel trusted? Do I feel psychologically safe? So, mm-hmm. you know, all of these elements kind of ringing true for me, but, um, you know, was my office, did I, did I listen to all these opinions? We talk about multiculturalism in businesses. Now, not every business will have multi multicultural elements to it, but even within cultures, there are, you mentioned it, microcultures and everybody's mindsets so different. So how they bring, regardless of what the color of their skin is or where they've, their, their kind of background is from, they each bring something unique and special if you allow them to have that psychological safety to be able to go, mm. oh, actually, I'm not sure that that's, you know, the stick. What a what a great example mm. of, I'm not sure that that would work, you know. How many businesses would mm. allow that? How many cultures would allow that? And the, and the fear for yeah. me is this kind of rigid mindset around a culture being just one thing and it then what we're seeing is potentially a cycle again starting of presentism over productivity or or purposefulness and and we're going to fall back into the pre-pandemic trap of being in the office is the only way to judge the culture and everything then is focused the the ingredients of the cake are focused on keeping people in the office rather than actually the outcomes the challenges that we truly want to solve in the face of the fact that people have changed after the pandemic the world of work Mm -hmm. has changed the balance has changed and people are the biggest question i think people are asking is why am i doing this so yeah that's why the culture i think needs to be so tightly um not controlled but so tightly maintained and enabled to Mm -hmm. grow so that it, it can be fed yeah I mean, I think one of the one of the things you mentioned there was the multiple, you know, obviously microcultures within teams. And I mean, we we talk a lot about psychological safety. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that people mistake that for is, you know, everyone get in a in a trust circle and have a hug at the end of the day. And actually it's it's not necessarily that it's, you know, a small team might have a culture where they do possibly bordering on the being rude to each other you know provide feedback but if, as long as the the psychological safety there is that actually this is as i said you know it's feedback on the work it's not a personal thing or even if i mean you know we don't want to go back to sort of macho cultures where it's you know you can basically be incredibly offensive and just call it banter and apparently get away with it although you know you know that that's not happening anymore yeah exactly it's yeah, yeah. um I mean, actually, a really funny story about that. I um, I went on a, uh, a cadet tour when I was 18 um, to Canada, and on the bus going into the um, army barracks, the um, master in charge of the barracks said, "You know, we don't like insults around here because an insult is like throwing a stone into a pond. You can't, you know, you, if you say an insult, you can't then go just kidding." Because once you've thrown the stone, it's in the pond, and then you've got the effect of the ripples that happen afterwards. Yeah. Um, which I, uh, for some reason, that's stuck in my head. <laughs> but, but there's, I think there's also um, going back to what one of the things you said. You know, all of the multi, the microcultures. Do you think there's a way that you can have a culture, an overall culture of psychological safety, and then you can have one team where they are a bit more huggy and and um you know let's be uh, let's all be friends against the culture where uh, my, another microculture with a team that they work with where it's slightly more um i want to say more sort of european where they say you know more dutch and less english i guess you know rather than apologizing for being alive you're this is this is the fact and we're just going to say it can well, those yeah. two cultures actually work together I think they can. I think it really depends on the purpose of what you're trying to do as a team. Um, yes, I mean, I, I've one of my most favourite times of working. I worked for a company called Archant, um, and I was the uh, group brand editor of um, uh, three magazines. I used to sort of edit and run them um, and manage the team of uh, small people. And I, I remember once the, the head of HR, who was ex-Navy actually, she came up to me and said, Adam, you've got the best team. How do you do it? Which, you know, uh, you know, I kind of, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Initially, you kind of think, you know, that's a bit of smoke blown up your bum. But, but in reality, it wasn't me that 
made the culture. I allowed the culture in that small team to become what it was. So I enabled everybody, I guess I created, I suppose inadvertently, a culture of psychological safety. I let people have strong discussions around things that were important to them. There were, one, there were, there were two uh, people on the team particularly, they're both designers actually, um, and they used to argue vehemently over little things like, um, oh, you're not using a baseline grid or, and it ruled sometimes quite technical design terms and, and, and it would get quite heated. It was like brother and sister arguing. <laughs> but even with all that, the reason I allowed that to happen within reason was I felt they cared. They mm. cared enough to argue about something as trivial to most people as a baseline grid. You're not using it, you should use it. And it was just two mm. different styles of, one was a very good designer and she was solid and she was so capable and 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 creative within her framework whereas the other the other guy was um he was kind of all over the show but he mm. still created they both came up with with the right design and they were on the right they had the right purpose so the right mindset for the purpose so i absolutely believe that i think it comes down to i guess the right people understanding the reasons why that it's okay to to have those discussions and and you know I've, I've worked my last role I was working with um, people from all over the world but particularly a German team and um, it was quite difficult to understand the cultural differences between the, the very direct approach that that um, the German team would have in conversations well why are you doing that I don't understand that doesn't make any sense to me but because it was a place of safety, it was okay well let's just talk about that what what do you mean mm -hmm. what is it let me help you understand so it wasn't there wasn't fear there wasn't ego or well, not much um, mm -hmm. that enabled you to kind of allow that because what i valued was the questioning because they cared but that also the fact that they were seeing it through a different lens than me you know it's a bit like all being in a football match and i'm sitting i haven't been well i've photographed many but i've not sat and enjoyed many but I'm sitting in a seat thinking, I've got the best seat in the house. I yeah. can see really close and I've got a great, I can see the players really close. And yet the person who's sitting up in in the boondocks with a pair of binoculars going, I can see everything. This is the yeah. best seat in the house because, you know, I've not got this or that and the ball's not going to hit me or whatever the case may be. So I think it very much depends on the lens at which you look through it and then the parameters of why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? And does that aid and empower that, I suppose? So a very long and rambling answer there. No, that's... Actually, you, you touched on something which um, I was thinking about um, earlier as well, which is, you know, you want you want to have that diverse experience, so people are coming at it from different, seeing it through the problem through different lenses. Yeah. And one of the things that um, I was chatting to a friend about it, saying, you know, if you're hiring someone who has only ever worked in one place, yeah. for me, that's. A slight worry if if they're very senior, obviously if they're junior, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can't you can't have a go. Um, yeah. But if they're very senior and they've only ever worked in one place, for me that's a worry because I know that they're probably going to have very fixed ideas. They've only experienced probably one one core culture. However, that's changed over the years. But one core culture and one particular way of doing it, especially with coding, you know, you everyone talks about best practices, but the best practice tends to be for that company because every project is different. Right. And um, there were a couple of worries there of how are you then going to bring someone who has that, especially if they are more matter of fact and are very passionate about the way that they've been taught to do it because they've then in the other company brought new people in and taught them their culture and their way of doing it. Yeah. How do you then make sure that they get embedded within your culture and your way of doing it if they're very um, strict on the way that they think things should be done. I think, I, I think this is um, how that happens would depend on the size of the company, I think. If it's a small company, um, I'd imagine that the, the culture will be quite raw and open. With a large company, the culture is, because you can't see everybody all the time, um, probably you see it in pockets. And I would, with a smaller company, yes, they can probably more directly influence the culture of the business because they do see everybody all the time. And if they're senior, particularly, and I find this more with people who are, they can be senior and not affect the culture. But if you're senior and have got hiring and firing capabilities, that's when the power, the relationship changes. 
because if you can fire somebody that's the ultimate power in a business you can give them a telling off you can change this and change that but ultimately if you can say right you're out i think that changes the the fear quotient of a relationship with somebody so in a larger company i think probably the culture will end up like anything it'd be water onto rocks and this individual unless they're an enormous personality somebody like musk or gates or, or richard branson as i understand anyway is that yes they probably can pull the culture but i think the culture will probably seep into them more if it's strong enough if it's a weak right. culture then i think a, a, a strong personality or somebody just very senior because they've got a badge or a title probably could in, in kind of infect that culture if you like for want of a better phrase um so i think it ra rather depends but it, i guess it comes back to the strength of the culture even an incredibly strong personality probably would end up grinding against those those edges um probably a lot and if they're if they're in a senior position you'd expect them to be quite smart have high ei and they'd probably understand that actually my approach is not going to work and very quickly go i need to adapt to this and if i want to change it um then i'm going to have to change either my strategy around it or i'm going to have to absorb some of the culture and let it change me so it really depends on the mindset of i think that that leader too as to um, what changes the most you would hope that both do because that's the mm. point you know you pour rather than a cup that's full i think a, a culture is a cup that never ends and you can just keep mm. it's never full so you can just keep putting more and more and more a bit like love you know it's mm. it's it just expands and grows um so i think culture should be the same same sort of principle in that it's you just pour more in and it's more value and it's better and it's richer and it's becomes more powerful and more purposeful but it does need that direction that's um it's really interesting. I love the way you go back to love. You know, we can talk about the English and the Dutch, very <laughs> English. <laughs> but um, what's love got to the... do with it? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we'll cut that bit out. Yeah, yeah, we will definitely. <laughs> That's a terrible um, Dutch accent. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I think there's so I, I've been in loads of teams, both in in sporting world and business, yeah. and I've seen. Um, one of my the most successful teams I was on um, was an under 25 team um, for the World Championships, and our captain very went on our first training weekend said, "I'm not going to put up with brilliant assholes. You know, right. if you can be the absolute best and you know just yeah. um, you know individually so great, but you don't want that toxic person in the team." Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's it's interesting because there you were talking about the, you know, if you're senior enough, then you should be able to take a step back, get over your ego and go, right, so I've just got to merge with this. But I've also been in lots of situations where there has been someone who is just toxic, who is the, you know, has their, their leader badge and keeps throwing it in your face. And it always makes me think of the, you know, if you have to say I'm the leader, you're not. Um, <laughs> you know, but... Do you think there's a, do you think there is a time where, or, or is it a training thing? Is it a recruitment thing? How do you either make sure that you don't end up with those people? Or is there a way that you can train those people and try to bring them along on the journey with you? Well, I think it's very much down to the individual. I mean, I've, I've been in businesses where you do the you know the rotten apple in the barrel maybe excellent at sales or marketing or design or something and yet they are so egotistical about it or hard or um i think ultimately the culture has to win the team has to win rather than the individual uh, um, and it's just a tough decision that has to be made um i think you need to enable that person to change i think good strong leadership of that person to help them understand what the culture of the business is um, and, and leadership is not just a person it is everybody pulling together because you always always must give people the opportunity to change so so important that should be part of the culture um, but it will get to the point if that person's unprepared to change through their own fear through their lack of that psychological safety or maybe sometimes it's just pure blind arrogance they just people are so different so ultimately i i think you have to make a tough decision and go yes maybe i'm going to lose a bit of income maybe we're not going to get those things done on time um but for me i look at that and go what, what's the opportunity i could creating um business abhors a vacuum same as nature 
um, and it won't be very long before somebody who who fits into that culture understands the mission more, understands that you work together, will fill that space and create something even better still. Um, because ultimately, I think we, we're you know businesses are on foolishly on this drive to be exponentially profitable and growth exponentially. It's an impossibility. It's a crazy way to exist. So. I'm doing enough, I'm turning over enough, you know, solving the right problems. For me, the problems come, you solve the problem, money becomes the outcome or the activity that generates the outcomes. I think those things are are outcomes of the activity. So, so yeah, I think ultimately it comes down to really strong leadership, really try hard to get that person to understand the challenges that they're creating. And if then they decide because everything's a choice if they decide no that's not for me the culture's not for me the team's not for me you just got to go well i'm sorry this this isn't working you've got to go well, sounds um yeah sounds dare i say the the f word but fair <laughs> um, <laughs> um i think just um just one more sort of quick thing just to bring it back to what we do obviously yep. which is you know hybrid working yeah. um uh how do you think what what are the main challenges you think about creating a good culture or managing or, or that is feeding into a good culture what what are the main challenges with that with the new world of sort of hybrid working well i for, for me it's it's a common and, and they understanding that productivity isn't located in one place for one you know in terms of hybrid working you can be creative and productive and effective and feel like you're contributing to the business sat in a car on the side of a motorway because you're making telephone calls or you're you've had you sit and have a coffee and you're writing up some notes or you go for a walk you, you spoke earlier about um you know going for a walk and just spending a time doing some thinking how is that not productive that it's it's valuing every element of of the cycle of being productive being part of a team and and moving something forward uh, fixing a challenge so I, I think that's one element of it um that psychological safety piece and labeling people and saying, look, I know I'm the boss, I will make the decision, but I'll do it in conjunction with you. People have got to feel like things aren't done to them, they're done with them. That, mm. I think, imbues a huge amount of psychological safety to enable people to go, I have a voice, I'm important here, and I value, I'm being valued. So therefore, I start to feel, actually, I do have a voice here. And it might only start small, it might be a little mouse voice. But you take the time to listen, you know, things like having regular one to ones with your team to kind of coach them through those those challenges and giving them the confidence to say, I really value your opinion and celebrating that too. having regular occasions where you you celebrate as a team. I think the loss is more than the wins in actual fact, because I think you learn more from the losses. So this becomes part of the the recipes, the ingredients of a culture. Where, where I do struggle a little bit is kind of this Gen Z, this fear of Gen Z seeing culture as a myopic view of a laptop and a beach. Or, a, mm. you know, I can just sit and create TikToks and 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 I don't need anybody else. It's very individualistic and only I can, you know, I'm the culture, the business is, that's me, I'm the culture. And, and it's this kind of little sphere of, I mean, yes, some people have done it, but the, people are, um, perhaps Gen Z more than anybody because they're so put off by what they're seeing going on in in cultures, their parents, what happened to them, you know, kind of and uncles and aunts and when they're going into the world work, it's like, oh my goodness, this is horrible. You know, mm. it's the cultures are terrible. It's just, you know, feast or famine or, or no one's really trust anybody. There's no discussions. It's not creative, blah, blah, blah. So I don't know if that, that hits the point, but I think that there, there's some just some simple things there about trusting people, not blind trust, but but extending trust to let people do their jobs, empl employ smart people, employ people for the culture, be really honest and transparent with people, accept feedback for what it is from the right people. Again, that comes you know, with, with a trust relationship um, and only do jobs that you really love as a leader, as an individual, because you, if you put yourself at odds with everything within the business straight away by joining a company that's it doesn't have the same values as you as a person or wants the same objectives of you, you shouldn't be there. Just mm. stop, you know, because when you go home at night, you want to actually, you know, you were already mentioned about people saying don't work at weekends. You want to stop, you know, this whole yeah. nine to five culture thing. I used to criticize that. Go, people, why aren't people passionate? They go home and they're, you know, dreaming up new ways to do things. Some people just don't like that. And that's yeah. OK. Accepting yeah. people for who they are. Yeah. 
No, I think that's that's really um uh, I mean that's the the core thing, isn't it? It's it's everyone's different except them for who they are and um yeah, treat them treat them with respect and make sure that you're not doing things to them, you're working with them. Um it's a very interesting point you said about the Gen Z and you know working and it's very insular. Their culture is is within them because they're doing things by themselves and yeah. going off and it's it I think it'll be interesting to see what happens when you know i don't want to be dismissive of it because some of them are incredibly successful yeah. but are is some of the stuff they're doing more of a fad which might stop in the in the near future you know in 10 years time are they still going to be doing it and at which point are they then going to try to join a company because they need money mm. and as i said i'll be looking at them going but you've only had one job and you've got your way of doing it you have no experience of a wider culture and of of that give and take, because however successful you are, um, you've got your fixed way of doing it. So, but it, but yeah, I think it comes down really to it's a really important point that you've made there. It, I think you can go into a culture that may be at odds with what you've experienced, but might be so much better because it's designed because mm. you lead with what you're trying to achieve and the culture that surrounds that. And you, that connective tissue you make part of the hiring process and say, right, this is really important. Your CV has got you through the door. That tells me something. But what I really care about is why you're here. Why us? Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing. Will you fit? Will you will you turn up the dials to 11? Not all the time, but is this going to... I used to say this to my team. There's a, there's a nuclear furnace inside people. That needs to be fed. If it goes cold, they're going to move on. Mm -hmm. It's just not yeah. right. And, and I think certainly that's something to learn from Gen Z. They're very prepared to go, I'm all right. I will try something else. This isn't working. So, and I think that I'm very excited to see what Gen Z are going to bring into cultures in the future because of their mindset around, I'm not prepared to accept there's only one way to do this. And that, that for yeah. me is, is like, wow, that's fuel on the fire of, of strong culture. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that's, well, that, that's the ambition that you're talking about. The not, not doing nine to five, it's, it's pushing a lot more. Yeah. Um, yeah, Adam, yeah, yeah. that's this been a really great conversation. Um, yeah, I'm seeing we're almost out of time, so yeah, thanks yeah. very much. Um, yeah, thanks, and um, yeah, we'll speak again soon. Thanks very much. Look forward to the next one. Cheers, John. Yeah, cheers.